the hardest part about having blocked arteries is suddenly having to drastically change just everything about your life, how you think, how you feel, how you live, how you eat, how you dot, 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 right? So much you have to change. It's just absolutely overwhelming. Even more overwhelming is the conflicting information available about, about what even causes plaque buildup in our arteries and how to reverse it if it's even possible. You have Verda Health, which focuses on nutritional ketosis with a ketogenic or high healthy fats, low carb, no bread, no rice, no flour, no grain, et cetera, et cetera, diet. To reverse your type two di diabetes, you have functional medicine practitioners who are all about the paleo diet. And then there's the full vegan diet, which um, Dr. Ornish talks about with, with his program, heavy on the grains, includes some dairy, and it also includes tofu. Doctor, Dr. Ornish, thank you so much for joining us. You are world renowned in terms of all of your programs that you've created to help reverse the number one killer likely in the world. So thank you for all you do. Thank you, you're welcome. So how do you suggest, I wanna just jump right into it, how do you suggest a patient actually know what's best for them in terms of their diet? Does it depend on advanced blood work? Uh, do you have any blood panels that you suggest for patients? You know, I've been doing research for the last 42 years. I'm a professor of medicine at UCSF and I started the Nonprofit Preventive Medicine Research Institute. Uh, and for the last 42 years, I've directed a series of, of scientific studies proving that simple lifestyle changes can reverse not only heart disease, but the progression of a wide variety of chronic diseases. And I have a new book called Undo It that radically simplifies all of this because, you know, we found, I mean, first of all, the whole point of science is to help people sort out what's true. You know, there are all these conflicting claims about diet and I've been a veteran of many of these diet wars and I've stopped doing these debates because, you know, we've, we've, we've shown in study after study, published in the peer review, the, late, the uh, most well-respected peer review journals like The Lancet, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association and so on, that simple lifestyle changes can reverse and prevent a wide variety of chronic diseases. And so, and that's really the whole point of science is to say, what is the evidence that, you know, you can say all kinds of things and telling people what they wanna hear is always, a good way to sell books or whatever. But the facts are that is that a whole foods plant-based diet that's mostly fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and some soy products uh, in combination with moderate exercise, various meditation and other stress management techniques and social support or eat well, move more, stress less, love more can reverse all these different conditions. And the more diseases we study and the more underlying biological mechanisms we look at, the more scientific evidence we have to show that that's true. So. I started years ago showing that these same lifestyle changes could reverse even severe heart disease, and we were the first to prove that. Uh, at that time, it was thought that you could only get worse, maybe get worse more slowly, but you were gonna get worse. We showed you can actually get better. Within a few weeks, we found that the heart is pumping blood more normally, that the blood flow to the heart improved. There was over a 93% reduction in the frequency of angina or chest pain. After a year, the even severely clogged arteries became measurably less clogged. After five years, there was even more reversal than after one year, whereas the control group that were making more moderate changes got worse and worse. We found, found that these same lifestyle changes could reverse high cholesterol levels, high blood pressure. Um, we did a study with um, the chairs of urology at Sloan Kettering in New York and at UCSF showing that these same lifestyle changes can slow, stop, and even reverse the progression of men who have early stage uh, prostate cancer and by extension, women with early stage breast cancer. We did a study published with Craig Venter, who was the first to decode the human genome, showing that these same lifestyle changes could actually change your genes and turning on the genes that keep us healthy, turning off the ones that cause us to get sick, over 500 genes in just three months. We did a study with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize for her pioneering work on telomeres, the ends of our chromosomes that regulate how long we live. And as our telomeres get shorter, our lives get shorter, and the risk of premature death from pretty much everything goes up correspondingly. We found for the first time we could actually lengthen telomeres. And when we published this in the Lancet, they called it reversing aging at a cellular level. And now we're in the middle of the first randomized trial to see if these same lifestyle changes may reverse the progression of early stage prostate cancer. And so it's not like there was one set of diet and lifestyle changes for reversing heart disease and a different one for prostate cancer or diabetes or whatever. It was the same for all of these. And so in our new book that I co-authored with my wife, Anne, 
we put forth this unifying theory that's radically simple. And it basically says, you know, with all this interest in personalized medicine and so on, you don't really have to do that. In other words, for example, um, you know, there are variations genetically in how efficiently somebody can metabolize how much sugar they eat or how much fat or carbohydrates or things like that. But if you're not eating that much of them, then those differences really don't matter so much. And so it's radically simple. It's saying that these same lifestyle changes can reverse all of these different conditions. And the radical theory is that they're really the same disease manifesting and masquerading in different forms because they share the same biological mechanisms, things like chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in your microbiome and the telomeres and gene expression and angiogenesis and, and so on. And each one of these mechanisms in turn is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have. And so it radically simplifies that. So you don't necessarily need to do, I mean, there are rare exceptions to this, but for most people, you don't need to pay thousands of dollars for expensive blood tests and things like that. To the degree that you make these changes, you're likely to get better. Now to reverse disease, it takes a lot. That's the pound of cure. And that's why, again, we were the first to prove that because most people didn't go far enough. But if you're just trying to stay healthy, lose a few pounds, whatever, the more you change, the more you improve and the better you feel. So it's not all or nothing. And you know, it, 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 like if you go on a diet, chances are you're gonna go off it. But this way, if you, if you indulge yourself one day, eat healthier the next. You don't have time to exercise one day, do a little more the next. You don't have time to meditate for half an hour, do it for a minute. Whatever you do, there's a corresponding benefit. And there, there's one in particular, though, blood work that I, I really talk to my patients about, and it's, it's the MTHFR, because I find a lot of people with heart disease, um, nine out of 10 of the people that I most recently asked all ended up with a mutation in that gene, which means, according to one dietitian that I've talked to, that you need to reduce the amount of grains that you eat, that your body doesn't process it properly. So a blood test like that, how do you modify if someone comes up with the MTHFR you know, mutation or such, um, how do you suggest they use your diet or make modifications with it to, um, so that their body can process things appropriately? Well, I think that's a good example of a test that most people don't need. Half the population has one or two of those, uh, of, of those uh, alleles to, uh, that are different. And it just affects your abilities to metabolize what's called homocysteine. And homocysteine is a substance that can lead to inflammation, which, as we talked about, can lead to a lot of different conditions. But then the question is, well, what is it that causes our body to make homocysteine in the first place? And it's the kind of animal protein, you know, red meat and things like that. And if you have more fruits and vegetables that are high in folate and low in in the things that are the substrates of, of uh, homocysteine. We found in all of our patients, you know, in all of our studies, I should say that overall homocysteine levels come down, markers of inflammation come down. You know, all grains are not the same. You can have your refined carbs, you know, white flour and white rice and, and then and sugar and things like that. But whole grains, fruits and vegetables and whole grains, whole wheat flour, brown rice and so on are actually good for you. This idea that all grains are bad is just not, not, not true at all. And we know that because all of our studies have proven that. You know, when, when you looked at blood flow to the heart, when we look at the ability of the heart to pump blood, most people who have chest pain, who can't walk across the street without pain, who can't make love with their spouse or their partner, can't play with their kids, can't go back to work because they have so much chest pain. Within a few weeks, most of them are pain free and are able to reduce or get off of medications under the doctor's supervision that they were told they'd have to take the rest of their lives to lower their cholesterol, their blood pressure, their blood sugar, and so on. Um, we know that these things work. And so it's not like a theoretical, let's focus on one specific uh, genetic you know, aspect. Um, we, we, we're looking at everything and we know that this works. And so the bottom line is that this program works. You know, that's why Medicare is now covering it. They're not covering functional medicine. They're not covering ketogenic diets. They're not covering these things because they're not proven to work, whereas this one is. Right, you have Verta Health that just raised more than $90 million from, uh, from investors who, for their hygienic diet. I'm sorry, who raised that? Uh, Verta Health, they're the company that is uh, helping people with type 2 diabetes right. to reverse it using the ketogenic well, diet. The major, but see, the major complication, see, people get kind of this tunnel vision. You say, well, what causes your blood sugar to go up? Well, eating too much sugar or concentrated sweeteners, high fructose corn syrup. Uh, will make your blood sugar up in type 2 diabetes because in type 2 diabetes, the problem is not that your body can't make enough insulin. It's actually probably making more insulin. It's that when you have these sudden surges of, of um, sugar, over time, your insulin receptors downregulate and you become insulin resistant. And over time, that can lead to type 2 diabetes. 
And so the, the things like sugar and when you, when you go from whole wheat flour to white flour or from brown rice to white rice, you're removing the fiber and the bran that ordinarily fill you up before you get too, too many calories, but they also slow the rate of absorption from your gut into your blood. So when you eat white flour or white rice or sugar, your blood sugar spikes, so your blood sugar goes way up. You get these surges of, of insulin that your body makes to try to bring your blood sugar down, but over time, those repeated surges of insulin downregulate the insulin receptor and you get insulin resistance and ultimately can get type two diabetes. But the goal is not to, and we all agree that, you know, those are not good things to be eating. It's what you replace them with. If you replace them with, you know, um, good carbs, you know, whole wheat flour and brown rice are rich in fiber and the fiber slows the rate of absorption. So instead of getting these wide swings in blood sugar, you get a nice constant level. And we know from our studies that most people who are even on insulin or other drugs to lower their, their blood sugar can reduce again under their doctor's supervision or get it off them altogether. Now, what's the major complication of type two diabetes? Heart disease and stroke. And so when you eat a diet, that's, if you replace, you know, I, I debated Dr. Atkins a number of times before he died and his autopsy, which was published, would show that he died of heart failure. You know, and other studies have shown that if you go on a ketogenic diet or a paleo diet, which is just another variant of the same kind of, of nonsense, your risk of heart disease goes up by 50% or more. Uh, there was a great, um, in my new book, in the Undo It book, there's a, a graphic that I republished with permission from the New England Journal of Medicine of what happens to arteries on different diets. On a, on a diet like I recommend, a whole foods plant-based diet, uh, they're clean, the blood is flowing through, the endothelium is working normally, the lining of the arteries, the blood's flowing. On a standard American diet, they're partially clogged, but on an Atkins, ketogenic, paleo, whatever the latest uh, variation of that is, they, those arteries are severely clogged, even if they're losing weight, even if their uh, triglycerides or other things come down. Now, one of the reasons why a ketogenic diet may help to lower blood sugar is that most Americans eat way too much sugar and white flour and white rice and things like that. But if you replace those with good carbs, then your blood sugar comes down and you reduce your risk of heart disease and diabetes and these other conditions. If you replace it with, with animal protein, you know, with you know, people who think that you know, grass-fed beef is good for you, there's not a shred of evidence to support that. In fact, all the evidence shows that we need to even move past this fat versus carbs debate, that animal protein itself is inflammatory. Um, and, and, um, and one study showed that people who eat a lot of animal protein have a 75% increased risk of premature death from all causes and a four to 500% increased risk of premature, premature death from type two diabetes and, um, and, 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 and conditions related to that. So, you know, like I say, people can, can raise a lot of money by telling people what they want to hear. Uh, it just, and I'd love to be able to tell people that grass-fed beef is good for you or things like that, but it's not. And so you can lose, you can actually reduce your blood sugar even more by replacing um, the bad carbs with good carbs and fruits and vegetables. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of protective substances in fruits and vegetables, you know, phytochemicals, bioflavonoids, um, carotenoids, retinols, isoflavones, genesine, lycamine, on and on and on, that have anti-cancer, anti-heart disease, and anti-aging properties. And again, the reason why I don't do these diet, diet wars anymore is that we've got 42 years of research published in the leading peer reviewed journal showing that all the markers of inflammation, type two diabetes, your, your hemoglobin A1Cs, your blood sugar, your arteries get less clogged, your prostate cancer gets better, you know, your telomeres get longer, your gene expression changes in favorable ways. So, you know, that's what the data show. And I think that uh, I'd love to be able to tell people what they want to hear, but this is what the facts show. With your vegan diet, how has it evolved over the course of the last two books? And as you prepare to release the paperback version of Undo It. I mean, a big part of what I've read is about the amount of fats you consume. Um, you know, that's really the antithesis of, of keto, which is more fat, the better, lean fats. But I know that from your initial program with your open heart program um, to your latest book, Undo It, you have eased up a little bit, mainly on nuts. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Actually, say in your new book that hey, some walnuts, a few almonds can be actually good for you. Yeah, well, ours is a science-based program. So as the science changes, then our modifications uh, reflect that. It's remarkable how little those changes have occurred in the 42 years I've been doing this work. Uh, I remember um, 20 years ago when I was uh, actually 1983 when I was uh, doing my medical residency at Harvard at Mass General, and my uh, mentor was uh, Alexander Leaf, who was the chief of medicine at Harvard. And he convinced me that uh, the omega-3 fatty acids that are found in fish oil or in algae-based omega-3s uh, are beneficial. And so I, 
I said, you know, we, we should include those, which we've been doing since, you know, the early 80s. And I remember having a conference call with the dietitians that, that I work with, and they said, oh, you, you can't add uh, fish oil on the Ornish diet. I said, who are you talking to? You know, it's like, this is not a cult. This is based on science. It's remarkable how little we've had to change. And for the same reason, when uh, the evidence became very overwhelming that small amounts of seeds and nuts are beneficial, even though they're high in fat, we've, we've included them. There's a germinative quality. Oh, seeds and nuts are, are life about to emerge. And I think there's something really powerful about that, but, but you know, in small quantities. You know, because I debated Dr. Atkins and he was the low carb guy, I somehow got pegged as being the low fat guy, but my program has never just been about low fat. It's about, it's a whole foods plant-based diet, you know, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and so on. That's naturally low in fat and low in sugar and so on. But um, uh, I guess the only other change that we've made is that we used to include a cup a day of non-fat dairy or, 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 uh, uh, or and egg whites. But I think the evidence that's come out since then says that if you're trying to reverse disease, it works even better if you eliminate those as well. You also say in your book, you believe that heart disease must be treated at a deeper level. And you touched on it in the beginning of this interview. Um, you're becoming more and more convinced that other factors, including emotional stress, perceived isolation, lack of social support, hostility, cynicism, and low self-esteem actually play very important roles. And I think that that's disempowering and empowering for people at the same time, that our mind-body connection is so powerful. Can you explain what happens in your mind that triggers that artery damaging inflammation and then discuss some tangible, actionable ways in, in which people can get a handle on this? Yeah, sure. When you say it's disempowering, I don't know what you mean. Well, it, it's some people don't like to know that they may have caused their own issue. Well, I never tell people that they cause their own issue. There's a very big difference between blaming and empowering. If you're just a victim of bad genes or bad luck or bad karma or you know, bad uh, enzymes or whatever, then what can you do? You're helpless, you know? I remember, you know, Bill Clinton has been a patient of mine since 1993, and 11 or 12 years ago, when his bypass is clogged up, one of his cardiologists held a press conference and said, oh, it's all of his genes, there's nothing he could do about it. And, um, and having been working with him for so many years, I knew it had everything to do with it, so I, I, I sent him an, an email and we met, and I, I said, look, not to blame, but to empower you. If you're just a victim, of bad genes, you know, then you know you're powerless. But you're not powerless. You're one of those powerful guys in the world. Um, they're not to blame, but to empower. You know, I never tell people you're at fault. I'm saying here's what you can do about it mm -hmm. as a way of empowering someone. And so in that spirit, um, you know, for this isn't a new re revelation. And all of my books get dating back to my very first one back in 1981. Um, uh, it's not just been been about diet. It's about all four: eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Study after study has shown that people who are lonely and depressed and isolated are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely from virtually all causes when compared to those who have a sense of love and connection and community. There's nothing that's more powerful than that. Um, you know, and it's also very hard to, to motivate people to change if you just give them information. I mean, if, if, if information were enough, nobody would smoke. It's not like you, I would say, hey, Mr. Jones or Ms. Smith, I want you to quit smoking. Did you know it's bad for you? They go, I didn't know that. I'll quit today. It's like everybody knows. I mean, we're, we're drowning in information in the era of Google and so on. Uh, but what, what, what I have learned is that it's not enough to just give people information or focus on their behaviors. We need to work at a deeper level, as you indicated. And so I'd ask people, you know, why do you smoke and why do you overeat and drink too much and work too hard and abuse opioids or play so many video games? These behaviors seem so maladaptive to me. And they go, you don't get it, Dean. You don't have a clue. These behaviors aren't maladaptive. They're very adaptive because they help us deal with our, our loneliness, our isolation, our depression. I've had patients say things like, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes and they're always there for me and nobody else is. You're going to take away my 20 friends? What are you going to give me? You know, or food fills that void or fat coats my nerves and numbs the pain. I think that's part of the appeal of high fat diets. You know, they kind of numb you out or video games numb the pain or opioids. We have this epidemic numb the pain or working all the time is a more socially acceptable way of distracting yourself from pain. And so when we work at the deeper level, because, you know, there's been a radical shift in our culture in the last 50 years with the breakdown of the social networks that used to give people a sense of love and connection and community. You know, 50 years ago, people had an extended family they saw regularly. They had a job that felt secure. They'd been at for a decade or more. They had two or three generations of people living together in a neighborhood. They had a church or a synagogue or a mosque or a club they went to regularly. 
And many people today don't have any of those things. In fact, one of the studies I cited in our new book is that the more time you spend on Facebook, the more depressed you are because it's not an authentic intimacy. Intimacy is really healing. Even the word healing comes from the root to make whole, to bring together. Yoga is to yoke, to unite. And anything that brings us together is healing. And the reason why, if you grew up in a family with two or three generations of people, for example, is that they know you. They don't just know your Facebook profile or, you know, that looks like everybody on Facebook has this perfect life, but you, you know, here we are in front of the Eiffel Tower, here we are, you know, whatever. Whereas when you grow up in a, a neighborhood with two or three generations of people, it's like, I see you, you know, I, 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 I know, I see your darkness, I see where you messed up, I see that time you got arrested or you went broke or you, your kid got, you know, on drugs or whatever it happens to be, and I'm still there for you. And so in our support groups, we try to recreate that by creating a safe environment where people can be authentic with each other, can let down their emotional defenses, can talk openly and authentically about what's really going on in their lives without fear that someone's going to judge or reject or, or give them glib, glib advice or whatever. And when we work at that level, then we find that people are much more likely to make and maintain lifestyle choices that are life enhancing than ones that are self-destructive. And so even though my lifestyle medicine program is now covered by Medicare, and if you're interested, just go to Ornish, O-R-N-I-S-H.com, and list all the sites that we're mm -hmm. here. If you're interested in learning to be trained or learning more about our work, just go there and, and uh, leave us your name. But what we're finding is that um, we're, the program is people come twice a week for four hours at a time for nine weeks. 94% of those sessions get completed, and a year later, 85 to 90% of the people are still following it. And yet, you know, two thirds of people who are prescribed statins to lower their cholesterol are not, are not taking them after just four to six months. And that's just taking a pill once a day. And people say, well, that's crazy. And I mean, you're getting a higher adherence rate to making these big lifestyle changes than just taking a pill. How could that be? And the answer is that the pill doesn't make you feel better, but the lifestyle changes do. And because these underlying biological mechanisms are so dynamic, when you make big changes in your diet and lifestyle, most people feel so much better so quickly it reframes the reason for making these changes from fear, like fear of a heart attack or fear of dying or fear of something horrible, to joy and pleasure and love and feeling good. And that what you gain is so much more than what you give up. So if you have heart disease and you can't you know, do anything because you get pain and within a few weeks your pain is gone, then they say things like, well, you know, I like eating cheeseburgers, but not that much because it's not about living to be 86 instead of 85 or preventing something bad from happening. That's not sustainable. But if what you gain is more than what you give up, if your brain gets more blood, you think more clearly, your skin gets more blood, you look younger, your heart gets more blood, you can reverse heart disease, your sexual organs get more blood. There's a, a wonderful uh, documentary called The Game Changers that came out that James Cameron and Luis Ayoyos did. <clears throat> and they, they give a single meat-based meal to these three elite athletes in their mid-20s. And they measure using a device the frequency and hardness of erections they have at night when they sleep because it's a normal guy function. The next day they give them a single plant-based meal and do the same thing. And all three guys have three to 500% more frequent and 10 to 15% harder erections after the single plant-based meal than after the single meat-based meal. And these are people who are in their mid twenties. So these mechanisms are so dynamic that when you make these changes, most people feel so much better so quickly in ways that matter. That's really what makes it sustainable, not to prevent, not fear of dying, but joy of living. It's interesting that you say that there's so much that can be done with lifestyle, and yet doctors, general practitioners in particular, are very hesitant to actually perform advanced testing to diagnose people sooner. Heart disease is no longer considered an old man's disease. It's been clinically proven that it's getting younger and younger and younger, and we still have a lot of people starting at age 35 that are having heart attacks. Why is it, my doctor told me that he wouldn't send me to a cardiologist because it, what, is, what is he going to do? Just give you a statin if you have heart disease? You know, you're not showing any signs or symptoms. It's the silent killer for a reason. Why not do this advanced testing earlier, diagnose it earlier, give everyone a better picture of what their arteries are doing so that we can make the choice to earlier to create these lifestyle changes. We should do it anyway, you could argue, but most well, of us won't do it unless we have to. Well, there is a motivational moment that comes when someone finds out that they're not just at risk for heart disease, but they yeah. actually have it. And if you don't change, you're likely to get worse. But if you are willing to make these big changes, you can actually get better. That's a powerful motivator. And so as I think as we develop better screening tests, you know, the ultra fast CT scans or the CT angiograms or so on. But I think the bigger issue is that 
you know, most doctors receive very little training in nutrition and lifestyle. I wrote a, I'm on the American College of Cardiology's Nutrition Committee, and we wrote a paper we published in the leading cardiology journal, the Journal of American College of Cardiology, uh, a year or so ago. And we surveyed and said, how much nutrition training does the average doctor get? And it's like four hours a year. And then we said, how much training in nutrition does the average cardiologist get in their four years of fellowship training? And it's zero. You know, so we're trained to use drugs in surgery. We're reimbursed to use drugs in surgery. And so that's what most doctors do. That's why I spent 16 years to work with CMS to get Medicare coverage, because I felt like if we can change reimbursement, then we change medical practice and even medical education. And fortunately, that's what's been happening. But you can also argue that these lifestyle changes are, are as you say, they benefit everyone and that you don't have to make such big changes to reverse it as you do, I mean, to prevent it as you do to reverse it. So everyone can benefit by making these lifestyle changes. Again, not to just prevent something bad from happening, but to reverse it. And I think as we get more, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're doing a study now to see if we can reverse Alzheimer's disease. So like a lot of people don't wanna know if they're at risk for something if they feel like there's nothing they can do about it. But if we can show we can reverse it, then we can, we, then probably will take even less to prevent it. I want to see if Dr. Ansari has a question for you. I'll let him get set up in the meantime, but before we get to him, let him think of a question. MJ has a question about supplements. Um, she also wants a little encouragement. She's been recently diagnosed with CAD with um, some significant blockages, and she wants that encouragement that she can actually reverse, and I think she's getting it here, reverse the heart disease and the plaque buildup. But her specific question is in regards to supplements, herbs, vitamins. Do you, what do you recommend? Hawthorn berry, turmeric, garlic? Yeah, well, can, I mean, it's the same process throughout your bodies, whatever arteries. That's one of the reasons, again, why the study with uh, the 25 year olds showed that their erections improved. Again, you know, erectile dysfunction is one of the most, uh, the best predictors of heart disease. Because if your penis isn't getting enough blood flow, chances are your heart isn't either. These are systemic processes throughout your body. It's one of the reasons why so many studies have shown that randomized trials that stents and angioplasties in stable patients really don't prolong life, prevent heart attacks, or even reduce angina in most patients. <clears throat> but when you change your lifestyle, it affects arteries throughout your body, including the peripheral arteries. And so people who have claudication because their legs aren't getting enough blood, often show significant improvements when they make these same lifestyle changes. Yeah, but in terms of peripheral artery disease, that can be pretty painful, and then people don't even, aren't even motivated to get out and walk because they're in so much pain. So a little angioplasty, even if they are stable, can help you know, get a little bit more blood flow going, so it'll alleviate some of the pain to get them out there and to walk beyond their mailbox. <laughs> True, but at the same time, most people with peripheral artery disease or coronary disease, for example, if they make big enough changes in in their diet and meditation and other things, and just do as much exercise as they can under, again, under their doctor's care. Those, those things were so, those mechanisms are so dynamic that within, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, in three weeks, we found a 91% reduction in the frequency of angina. So you get into a, a virtuous cycle instead of a vicious one where you, you, know, you have pain when you walk, so you don't exercise and you don't eat well because you're depressed, and then everything just gets worse and worse over time. Dr. Ansari, did you have a question for Dr. Ornish? I think I want to congratulate Dean Ornish. I'm a big fan of his Thank you. Uh, book. And uh, I've seen him in CNN uh, uh, talking about reversing heart disease. So congratulations. I think you've been very succinct, very honest. And I, I'm, I'm an interventional cardiologist, but I can tell you, I try to preach what you say to every one of my patients. One yeah. of my problems is, I'll tell you the real problem which I get is, I have no problems what you're saying. One of the problem is compliance. Uh, you get to see these patients, and I try to tell them, and I have a nurse who will especially sit down with them. Uh, I'm, I'm fed up, I mean, after so many years. Maybe you have a magic bullet. You know more. People listen to you. Uh, how to convince the patient general population? How to follow those instructions? And I think this is the main problem. I practice in an area which is close to the Mexican border, and I see these patients. Uh, with a BMI average of about 40. And uh, I just, just, they do a very poor diet. Uh, they are all pre-diabetics. They don't exercise. Um, and um, one of the patients told me that, you know what, to eat, add, eat all these uh, vegetable and high grain foods and plant-based, but it is expensive, doctor. You get my hamburger only for two bucks and you're talking. Uh, so it's a lot of, it's not as easy as uh, to comply. I feel the richer patients when in La Jolla and Ranch to Santa Fe, uh, the way in San Diego are more, more, much more compliant. They walk in the beaches. But my problem is 
compliance, and especially in people who have uh, poor means and who wants to satisfy that insolent surge, which you have beautifully okay. described. Well, I mean, you know, we've trained a program at UC University of California, San Diego, so you can refer patients there. And Medicare is covering that, and many of the insurance companies are as well. And that provides people the structure and the support that, that most practitioners, most cardiologists and, and uh, internists and family practitioners don't have the time or training to do. And so that's why, you know, we've set this up to make it available to the people who most need it. I didn't want this just to be concierge medicine for people who could afford it. I want it to be for everyone. And so, you know, if you can refer your patients to our program at UCSD, that would be one way to do it. Um, but, you know, this is basically a third world diet. This is the way people ate before they could afford to, you know, eat more meat and things like that. Yeah, you, sure, you can eat a plant-based diet that's truffles and, you know, really expensive stuff. But, you know, it's essentially, especially if you buy it in bulk, these are very, these are foods that people eat when they can't afford anything else. Now, I worked with, um, you know, the Department of Agriculture to try to change the food subsidies because, you know, back in 1999, I worked with the CEO of McDonald's to get them to put salads on the menu. And the irony was that the, the, the dollar was, I mean, the, the, the cheeseburger was 99 cents. The salad was 5.95 because the, the burger is subsidized and the, and, the, and the salad is not. So it's not only is it not the, the real cost of society, but it's actually cheaper to eat that way because the junk food is subsidized. Yes. But that's changing slowly. So I'm doing what I can. I mean, you can do what you can. And one thing to do is, you know, send your, send your patients to uh, UCSD and then we can support you, you know, you were, you know, all therapeutic decisions, you're still in charge of those patients, they're your patients, but we can do the stuff that you don't have the time or training to do. Yeah, we have um, a question here about, uh, she's not in the geographical location where any of your programs are offered. Any um, plans for one in Southern New Hampshire, about an hour north of Boston? We're going to be offering, uh, one of the things Medicare will pay is not only for twice a week, four hours at a time for nine weeks, that's 72 hours. But they'll also pay six hours a day for 12 days, which is 72 hours. So beginning in the fall and maybe sooner, we'll be offering 12 day residential retreats at a very nice place here in, in the Bay Area where people can come. And um, most of that cost, if not all, depending on their insurance, uh, will, will, will be covered by that. And again, so we can democratize this whole experience for the people who most need it. And then people can come from anywhere in the country or for that matter, anywhere in the world and want to, want to get the program. And that's why we're hoping with the weight of my heart that we can actually take your program and maybe help you to scale it online because we have more than 3,000 patients around the world that can really use this and have that ability or, or the, you know, with money to even get to your location. So, and, for, and if people are interested in learning more about the retreats and other things, just go to ornish.com, leave your name, and then we will, uh, we will when we're ready to... Send, to begin them, we'll send you the information on that. I, I have a question, Kim. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, uh, Dr. Arnish, uh, when you were on, you gave Bill Clinton, when he had stents put in, you changed his diet and you put him on a vegan diet. You told him he cannot have milk. And what's the basis for that? Number one. Number two is, do you measure small dense LDL and the particle numbers before and after you have uh, start them on your program. Do you measure the HDLs, good HDLs and bad HDLs? Do you follow the triglycerides? Uh, are you a fan of Vasipa, the new medication which has come over to lower triglycerides? Do you believe in the reduce it trial? Okay, and well, do you you've, believe you've, in you've asked, you've, asked number, you've, not, you've asked enough questions for one moment. So let me try to <laughs> parse. Sorry about okay, so. Number one, Bill Clinton has talked publicly, he's lactose intolerant, he can't drink milk. So, uh, and he doesn't drink milk. Uh, number two is we don't measure, um, you know, small dense, I mean, we've done this from a research standpoint, we've shown clearly that uh, small dense LDL, I mean, LDL on average goes down 40% on patients who, who make these lifestyle changes, this is what we publish in JAMA. Uh, and it tends to reduce the small, LD, small dense LDL, which is the more atherogenic, as you know, uh, preferentially. We don't measure HDL because, you know, HDL is one of those things that, um, you know, people think anything that raises HDL is good and anything that lowers it is bad, but your body makes HDL as part of reverse cholesterol transport to get rid of excessive fat and cholesterol in your diet. So one of the best ways of raising HDL is to have a stick of butter. We found that the HDL actually goes down when people go on the program that I have, but their LDL goes down much more 
And the bottom line is that their PET scans show a 400% improvement in blood flow. Their arteries show that they were less clogged over time. Their hearts beat more normally. We even have over a dozen people who had such severe ischemic cardiomyopathies that their ejection fractions were so low, they were told they needed a heart transplant. And when they went on this program after nine weeks, their ejection fractions, their ability of the heart to pump blood improved so much they didn't need one anymore. And so from a research standpoint, those tests were useful to get a better insight of what's really happening. But in clinical practice, in most people, you don't need to do that. And Margaret has a question really quickly. We're only going to take a couple more. Um, we want to respect your time. She yeah, wants to know if age has bearing on diet and lifestyle. We have some doctors up here in the Bay Area that say that, um, well, you're too old. Eh, you know, you're not going to make the changes anyway. And even if you do make diet and lifestyle changes, it's not going to make that much of a difference. So she wants to know what you think about yeah. what. Well, has so any I, thought, I, I thought that, I mean, that's a reasonable question. I actually believe that when I first started doing research. I thought the younger patients who had milder disease would do better and be more likely to make these changes, but I was wrong. It turned out it wasn't how old or how sick people were. It was simply a function of the more they changed their lifestyle, the more they improved in every way we can measure, including in their arteries. In the lifestyle heart trial, uh, the, young, the, the oldest patient was 86 when he started. And he showed more reversal than anyone, but he was a very disciplined guy and he really made bigger changes than anyone. He ended up living to be uh, almost 100, even though he was only given a few months to live when he started. So that's the good news is, again, not to blame, but to empower that if you're stable, it doesn't really matter how old you are, it's never too late to begin making these changes. That's fantastic. Any last words that you want to add before we go, just in terms of your core beliefs and yeah. tangible, actual things people can do? Well, for me, doing this work is a conspiracy of love, if you will, that um, having seen what a powerful difference these changes can make, my, I want to share them with people who can benefit from it. That's why, you know, I write books, I do research, I work, spent 16 years with uh, CMS to get Medicare to pay for this, why we're training sites around the country and so on, is that I've seen how much, you know, we tend to think advances in medicine have to be a new drug, a new laser, something really high tech and expensive. And I think our unique contribution has been to use these very high tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions could be. Drugs and surgery have their place. They can be life-saving in a crisis. Mm -hmm. But if that's all we do, then people are told they have to take, like when, I get, when a, a patient gets put on a drug to lower their cholesterol or blood pressure or blood sugar, and they say, doctor, how long do I have to take these? The doctor usually says, forever. Mm -hmm. I, when I lecture, I've often shown a cartoon of doctors busily mopping up the floor around a sink that's overflowing, but nobody's turning off the faucet. Like, how long do I have to mop up the floor? Like, forever. Like, well, why don't we turn off the faucet? Why don't we treat the cause? And to a much larger degree than once we, we had once realized, the cause are these lifestyle choices we make every day mm -hmm. and how quickly you can get better. Not again, again, not just to live longer, although you probably will, but to live better. And that's really what makes it sustainable. So I appreciate the chance to be here, and I, I hope that at least part of it's been useful. Well, I think that you give so many people hope when so many doctors say they don't understand why uh, why cardiovascular disease even exists. Well, we don't know why you have it. Well, yeah, we kind of do. And actually, Dr. Athar Ansari, who, who's here, is one of the first ones to um, let me know this five years ago, that yes, we do know what causes it, and we do need to make changes. And when my dad was first diagnosed, he was the only cardiologist that was actually saying, hey, here's exactly what you need to do. And it, it was life-saving for him. So we really appreciate you so much, Dr. Cornish, for being here. His book, his latest book is Undo It, but I would suggest reading um, several of his books. I believe you have seven of them. That's right. And they've all been bestsellers, which means that we're getting the word out there. And so I appreciate you're helping me raise awareness, because to me, awareness is always the... Uh, first step in healing. So again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And uh, for people who want more information, just go to the book or to ornish.com. Thank you.